Lecture 9, on Ethics, Contemporary Moral Problems. Part 3, Applied Ethics, Euthanasia. 1. Euthanasia, an introduction, from the Greek euthanatos, die well or easy death, as our text says, euthanasia is often referred to as mercy killing. The common phrase, put me out of my misery is an allusion to euthanasia, and it comes in a variety of categories. Two key terms, the categories of euthanasia that we will be examining are voluntary euthanasia, non-voluntary euthanasia, active euthanasia, and passive euthanasia. Voluntary euthanasia means that the person being killed is choosing to die. Non-voluntary means the decision is being made by someone else. Active euthanasia means to kill by intervention such as a lethal injection. Passive means to allow someone to die naturally like switching off life support. In the following sections we will examine situations in which arguments for and against euthanasia may arise. 3. Case 1. Persistent vegetative states. A person is said to be in a persistent vegetative state when they are alive but have no signs of mental capability. A truly tragic picture of a person no longer able to consciously perceive, communicate, move on their own, and so on. Indeed, this is difficult to think about. Our text gives examples of people who suffered terrible accidents leaving them in persistent vegetative states, giving their families reason to pursue euthanasia on their behalf, that is, non-voluntary euthanasia. For case 2, incurable and terminal illness, another terrible case to consider is that of incurable illness. Unfortunately, we can easily imagine scenarios in which, a person learns that they have an incurable illness and, as the illness progresses, the symptoms become more painful until life becomes unlivable. In such cases, people have requested euthanasia, that is, voluntary euthanasia. 5. Pro-euthanasia argument 1. The first argument for euthanasia examined in our text is the so-called, argument from quality of life. This argument would have us ask ourselves, at what point am I better off dead? From a hedonistic perspective, the incurable illness example we just discussed may constitute an instance in which euthanasia might be acceptable, since, through the hedonist ethical lens, happiness or pleasure are the qualities that constitute the good. If living becomes nothing but constant pain, then the hedonist might be committed to endorsing euthanasia. From an Aristotelian virtue ethics perspective, the persistent vegetative state example may warrant euthanasia since there is no possibility to nurture the rational and appetitive soul of the patient. Regarding the quality of life argument, when applied to cases of persistent vegetative states, Jonathan Glover argues, I have no way of refuting someone who holds that being alive, even though unconscious, is intrinsically valuable, valuable irrespective of the form of being alive. But it is a view that will seem unattractive to those of us who, in our own case, see a life of permanent coma as in no way preferable to death. From the subjective point of view, there is nothing to choose between the two. From this perspective, being dead or being in a persistently vegetative state are basically the same thing, and people who end up in this state are sometimes euthanized. In these cases, where euthanasia is deemed preferable, active euthanasia is usually considered more morally defensible than passive euthanasia. It may be more appealing to receive a lethal injection than for doctors to merely surrender a patient to a disease to let nature take its course, and thereby allowing for a far more painful and perhaps undignified death. 6. Pro-euthanasia, Argument 2, the second argument in favor of euthanasia, referred to in our text as the argument from resource use, is sometimes perceived to be lacking the same moral thrust enjoyed by the argument from quality of life. The examples in our text are quite disturbing, so I will not repeat them here, but the basic idea is that keeping someone alive in a persistent vegetative state or prolonged treatment for someone who would prefer euthanasia, requires expensive resources and labor on behalf of medical professionals, that could be allocated to more promising treatments for other patients or towards research to cure diseases that could save more lives. From a utilitarian perspective, using those resources to save more lives would be morally preferable, on their view, since it would provide a greater good, to a greater number of people. Indeed, through this moral lens, using these resources to prolong the life of someone in a persistently vegetative state would be morally impermissible when they could be used to help any number of other patients. 7. Pro-euthanasia, argument 3, 
the third argument for the moral permissibility of euthanasia is thought to be the most fundamental and most powerful in applied ethics, namely, the argument from personal autonomy. We generally agree that people should be able to make decisions for themselves about how they want to live their lives and that we all have the proper authority to do so. It is argued that this authority over our lives extends to our right to die if that's what we choose. According to our text, John Stuart Mill is among the most famous proponents of this view. Recall from chapter 2, Mill endorsed the so-called harm principle. A principle which states, the only legitimate government interference in a person's life is to prevent that person from causing harm to others. According to this view, unless somehow a person's death would cause harm to others, euthanasia in the cases we've discussed, namely persistent vegetative states and painful, incurable illnesses, is morally permissible. Or as Peter Singer articulates it, the principle of respect for autonomy tells us to allow rational agents to live their own lives according to their own autonomous decisions, free from coercion or interference, but if rational agents should autonomously choose to die, then respect for autonomy will lead us to assist them to do as they choose. 8. Anti-euthanasia, Argument 1. The first argument we examine in our text against euthanasia is the objection from sanctity. Sanctity is a quality of being holy, or sacred, and important. While this argument can be deployed in a secular sense, it is typically advanced from a Christian perspective. Our text gives multiple references to biblically ground this reasoning, but this is unnecessary for our current purposes. What is important is that we understand this as deontological reasoning, not consequentialist reasoning. The consequences of our allowing euthanasia are not what makes it immoral. What makes euthanasia immoral on this view is that it violates our duty to God. Furthermore, the quality of life doesn't matter on this view. All life is sacred whether in a persistent vegetative state, incurably ill, or perfectly healthy. Our text gives two voices to this argument, the first being the famous Mother Teresa, who commented, For me, life is the most beautiful gift of God to mankind. Therefore people and nations who destroy life by abortion and euthanasia are the poorest. I do not say legal or illegal, but I think that no human hand should be raised to kill life, since life is God's life in us, even in an unborn child. Mother Teresa's view is consistent with the 1980 Catholic Declaration of Faith also presented in our text, which reads, No one is permitted to ask for this act of killing either for himself or herself or for another person entrusted to his or her care, nor can he or she consent to it, either explicitly or implicitly, nor can any authority legitimately recommend or permit such an action. For it is a question of the violation of the divine law, an offence against the dignity of the human person, a crime against life, and an attack on humanity. 9. Anti-euthanasia, Argument 2, the second argument, which seems to have less persuasive force for some people, Christian or otherwise, than the objection from sanctity, is the objection from valuable suffering. Basically, this objection is based on the idea that some suffering is part of God's plan and that suffering, particularly at the end of one's life, is important since it allows us to share in Christ's passion. So, the suffering is good for us, for some reason, and this idea is not unique. Indeed, Many argue that some suffering is necessary for the development of character, appreciation, and other virtuous qualities, but John Hick's soul-making theodicy is close enough to warrant mention here. Hick's theodicy was basically an attempt to explain the coexistence of God and evil, or, as it is called in the philosophy of religion, the problem of evil. For, if you recall from Lecture 5, God is supposed to be omnipotent and omnibenevolent, However, if God were omnibenevolent, he wouldn't want people to suffer, and if he were omnipotent, then he would be able to stop all suffering, and yet, suffering exists. The conclusion that follows is that God does not exist. However, Hick explains this in terms of soul-making, that is, God allows evil and suffering to exist in the world in order to develop us into virtuous people who are capable of following God's will. Thus, developing us for the better and fortifying our souls. Therefore, God does exist, he is both omnipotent and omnibenevolent, and evil only exists because it provides the valuable suffering that is at the core of this objection to euthanasia. Basically, God is omnibenevolent and allows suffering because he wants what is best for us. However, this doesn't explain away a related issue with God's plan, 
If God is also omnipresent and omniscient, then God already knew what decisions his creations would make before he created them, both good and evil decisions, and yet, he created them to make those good and evil decisions. Aside from the implications this has for free will, it also seems to crumble this objection. Ultimately, since God knew all of our decisions before he created us, then decided to create us so, all of our decisions are, therefore, part of God's plan, since he created us knowing we would make those decisions. After all, his will be done, there is no way anyone could do anything other than what God knows they will do, because God knows it. Therefore, a decision on the part of a patient suffering from an incurable illness or a family member of a patient in a persistently vegetative state, whether to euthanize or not euthanize, would be part of God's plan. In short, since God is omniscient, everything that actually happens is part of God's plan, so the objection from valuable suffering is meaningless, since we cannot go against God's plan anyway. 10. Anti-euthanasia, Argument 3 the third objection to euthanasia is a common objection to many moral issues, namely, the slippery slope objection. Indeed, I can recall in the early 2000s people arguing that allowing gay marriage would result in people being allowed to marry pets and children. However, after all these years, that hasn't happened, despite gay marriage being made legal. This objection is also referred to as the slippery slope fallacy, which basically claims, with little to no evidence, that one course of action will inevitably lead to undesirable consequences in an unintended chain of events. Our text seems to share my understanding that once a fallacy is identified in an argument, it is tempting, and to some degree justifiable, to completely disregard that argument until the arguer figures out what is wrong with their reasoning and can come back to discuss the issue like an adult, without fallacious reasoning. However, this is elitist thinking on our part since not everyone learns in detail how to think logically, nor does everyone study philosophy, so how could they possibly be ready for such an argument? Furthermore, when encountering such an argument, we ought to be as charitable as possible, and consider how likely the cause and effect relationships are in someone's slippery slope objection. Indeed, it is one thing to write off an argument based on superficial fallaciousness, and it is quite another to overcome the sliver of potential truth in an interlocutor's argument. We ought to consider how likely the chain of events proposed in an argument actually is before writing it off completely. For example, according to the New York Post, a Canadian soldier, who was looking for help with PTSD, was offered euthanasia as a solution to his mental illness, despite the progress he had made working with Canadian doctors through the VA. Essentially, what the veteran was told was, oh, you are still having issues with mental health. Maybe you should kill yourself, how does that sound? The fact that this is supposedly already happening should serve to counterbalance our concerns regarding the fallaciousness of this type of argument. Indeed, the legality and moral permissibility of euthanasia are quite problematic when considering patients with mental health issues, especially veterans, who are at an increased risk of suicide. 11. Anti-euthanasia, Argument 4 The fourth argument is another intuitive idea that involves delaying judgment since progress is made so rapidly in medicine, electing euthanasia seems unjustified. Indeed, the day after we elect for euthanasia, a medical breakthrough could be discovered or published. With the rate of scientific advancement, how can we justify cases of euthanasia on the part of incurably ill patients who still have time? 12. Allowing versus doing, our text offers a brief, but detailed differentiation between merely allowing someone to die and effortfully bringing about someone's death. James Rachel sums up the supposed moral importance of the distinction between allowing and doing in the euthanasia debate. Rachel's explains, the distinction between active and passive euthanasia is thought to be crucial for medical ethics. The idea is that it is permissible, at least in some cases, to withhold treatment and allow a patient to die, but it is never permissible to take any direct action designed to kill the patient. This doctrine seems to be accepted by most doctors. As discussed earlier, merely leaving someone to die naturally appears abominable, but what I think our authors have in mind here is allowing someone to die while treating their pain and other symptoms as best as possible while they remain. Even though theorists who view this issue through a Christian ethical lens may be opposed to all forms of euthanasia by default, the doctrine of double effect, which you should recall from chapter 4, lecture 5, keeps them in the debate.
In cases of euthanasia, where primary precepts seem to conflict, namely, prevent suffering and preserve and protect life, Aquinas might appeal to his doctrine of double effect. Let's work through the doctrine using a euthanasia case. Killing someone would seem to go against the natural law to protect and preserve life. However, Aquinas might have us consider the act itself and the motivation, the internal act. Though one should not compromise someone else's life, if the act's motivation is to protect someone from undue suffering, then it may be morally permissible. This is due to Aquinas' doctrine of double effect which states that an act that violates a primary precept can be morally acceptable if it also meets the following four criteria. 1. The act must be a good one. 2. The act must come about before the consequences. 3. The intention must be good. 4. The reasons must be serious. We can see that principle 1 is met because preventing suffering is a good act. The second principle is met because the harm that the passively euthanized patient received occurred after the doctors treated the pain or symptoms. Principle 3 is met because the intention was to prevent suffering. Finally, the fourth principle is met because cases of incurable illness are very serious. However, not everyone buys this line of reasoning, both Rachels and Singer have little time for the distinction between allowing and doing, and the doctrine of double effect, in this debate. Rachel says that, if a doctor lets a patient die, for humane reasons, he is in the same position as if he had given the patient a lethal injection for humane reasons, if the doctor's decision was the right, to not intervene on the patient's death, one, the method used is not itself important. Meanwhile, Singer comments that we cannot avoid responsibility simply by directing our intention to one effect rather than another. If we foresee both effects, we must take responsibility for the foreseen effects of what we do. This reasoning is also controversial, however, if we consider a brief thought experiment, imagine a doctor conducting triage and assigning patients to other doctors for treatment. One doctor is assigned a terminally ill patient who is also reportedly requesting euthanasia. The doctor foresees the possible effects and wants no part in it. So, the doctor passes the case off to another doctor, who ultimately makes the decisions that lead to reducing the patient's pain but not extending life. It's not clear, on Singer's view whether or not the first doctor avoids responsibility for the patient's death, even though the first doctor didn't participate in the patient's treatment, which would be counterintuitive. 13. Summary As our text sums it up, euthanasia is an applied moral topic that has profound implications, Successful moral arguments may lead to legislative changes that quite literally shorten or extend lifespans. There are a host of subtleties in the debate to which we can only pay lip service, such as the acceptability of active euthanasia of depressed patients, the importance of pre-injury requests for treatment or for death, the best way of allocating medical resources, the powers of people over both their bodies and the bodies of incapacitated family members. Further issues are discussed in works such as that by J. David Vellerman, and we suggest the references linked below as a guide to useful and inquiring texts. However, we hope that you now feel confident to explain and evaluate the key arguments both in favor and against the various methods of euthanasia and the various contexts in which those methods may be employed. 14. Questions and Tasks Our text asks 12 interesting questions in the Issues to Consider section, however, as usual, Please answer the following questions before next time. 1. What makes a life worth living? Is a life ever without value? 2. Should the doctrine of double effect be ethically relevant? Is there a moral difference between allowing and doing? 3. If euthanasia is morally acceptable, should passive euthanasia ever be viewed as an acceptable method? 4. Should a depressed patient ever be allowed euthanasia? Is personal autonomy something we must always respect? If not, when should it not be respected? Before we conclude, let us examine some possible views on euthanasia side by side. If we examine euthanasia through a Kantian ethical lens, we must first ask ourselves does the statement we should always provide euthanasia to terminally ill patients sound like a universally applicable maxim? Does providing euthanasia treat people as ends in themselves? For Kant, the answer is likely, no. Kant's conception of suicide, namely, 
killing yourself out of self-love to avoid future pain, is too similar to providing euthanasia to a terminally ill patient to avoid future pain. If you recall from Lecture 3, Kant saw killing oneself out of self-love as contradictory, and therefore, could not be an imperative. What is less clear, on this view, is whether euthanasia for persistently vegetative state cases would also be immoral. Since Kant grounds morality in reason does that mean that patients in persistently vegetative states have a moral standing reduced to that of animals or less? Can they no longer be treated as ends in themselves? These are unclear, but it does seem as though, through the Kantian lens, euthanasia would be immoral. As discussed briefly earlier, from a utilitarian perspective, if the patient's death doesn't cause anyone else any harm, then ending their pain by ending their life would be a moral course of action. As discussed earlier, since the resources used to sustain a patient in a persistent vegetative state could be used to help others, euthanasia may provide the greatest good for the greatest number of people also. Moving on to the Aristotelian lens, recall that this view looks inward at ourselves rather than at individual actions. The moral permissibility of euthanasia depends, therefore, on the virtue from which the doctor or patient acts. Furthermore, that virtue would be a mean between the vices of excess and defect. Perhaps we could say the doctor was temperate or conscientious in deciding to euthanize the patient because they were in great pain and had no hope for a cure. If the doctor had not euthanized the patient out of indifference, a defect vice, then the doctor would be vicious. The doctor would also be vicious if they did not euthanize in order to ensure that the patient died slowly and painfully out of wrath or malice, an excess vice. Similarly, if the patient requested euthanasia out of wisdom and courage, knowing that the inevitable suffering would be gratuitous and that death is not to be feared, then perhaps the patient would also be virtuous. If the euthanasia were sought out of cowardice, however, then the act would be vicious. Furthermore, if the patient neglected all advice from medical professionals and elected for passive euthanasia and suffered a gratuitously painful death, this would be rash and thus vicious also. In the persistent vegetative state case, the patient is clearly unable to live a good life according to Aristotle since the rational soul is apparently absent, so there may be no moral objections to euthanizing on this view.